the point is, you know, we can help you. We can allow you to help yourself. We can replace you. We have an investment in you from time, money, resources, training. So in a way, us helping you is protecting our investment, which makes good business sense. But like those are kind of the three options. And I was I was laughing, you know, thinking about that. I was like, man, if that just isn't every like work environment on the planet, everybody, it really comes down to those options. Like we can help you. If I have a staff person with a problem, he's like, we can help you. We can allow you to just help yourself and figure it out yourself. Or, you know, we can replace you. If you're not performing, you know, in your in your role or you have people on your teams who aren't performing, you know, how are these conversations going with them? Are you really setting out realistic expectations about how to work through their troubles? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Big Dog Podcast with the little dog. Yo. What's going on? Not much. Little dog, six foot three. Big dog, five, eleven and a half. Yo, it's six foot. Oh, yeah. What? Look, don't like height shame me. I'm not. I wasn't height shaming you. I, I mean, I think when you laugh, when you start with, when I say, when I open with here with the little dog, little dog six foot three, like I'm hyping you up. And then you're like, uh, uh, the big dog, uh, five foot 11 and a half. Nah, I'm I six was, foot, son. I thought we were just saying stats. No, six foot, son. Yeah, but like when I was six foot. The important was, like, thing about taller, stats but... are accurate is accuracy. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Five foot 11 and a half. Don't height shame me. Okay, 5'12". That's six foot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> height shaming, man. Look, I got short ass legs. I have a, a tall torso. I have a small torso and long legs. That is true. That is true. You get that from your mama. Your mama's got the long ass legs. Yeah. So it's Kiki. Everybody's got long legs but me. Huh. But I am six foot. Yep. Don't ever height shame me again, particularly <laughs> On the interwebs. I didn't know anything was wrong with under six foot. Whoa, whoa. Maybe for most, but I am who I am. And I am six foot tall. Okay. That's what the license says. <laughs> That's what the doctor stuff say. When has the government been wrong? Anyway. Wow. I didn't know this was going <laughs> to jump off in that style. So you doing all right, though? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, it's nice to be in the studio. Yep. We haven't been in here in a minute. Got some big changes coming to the studio in the coming weeks and, and month, probably. So that'll be pretty fun. You guys will see some differences if you're watching on video. Sound hopefully doesn't change too much, but uh, video will look differently if you like to watch us on YouTube. Thanks, Mamu. Always good looking out, keeping our views high. We love it. What's going on with you? Nothing? Uh, just working. Yeah. Got to see Jenna. Last weekend. Nice. It's a good time. Up at James Madison. Yep. You. That's cool. Yeah, Kiki has been on her college tours lately, and she just went and did the tour up at JMU, the official tour. She did the self-guided tour, Homecoming. And then we did UVA. We did... Where else did we go? Oh, uh, Mary Washington. I don't think I've talked about that on here, have I? No, nope. I don't think so. So we we went to we we're gonna do a little tour weekend, college tour weekend. It's that time of year for for high school juniors, I guess. So we roll up on Mary Washington, which is in Fredericksburg. Kiki didn't even want to get out of the car. She's like, "Yeah, I can't see myself being friends with any of these people." <laughs> I mean, I appreciate that she just called it like she saw it, um, and we didn't waste any time. It was, I, I think it was too small. Mm. So we just rolled on down the road. We went to UVA. I'm not really going to jump into that here on the show. But there were some alarming things that were, were said during that presentation. It got weird. It got really, really weird. I'll only go into it a little bit. I won't go into it like like super heavy because I don't like to bring politics and stuff into the show that's not what the show is for but it was surprising to me this one little piece when we were at the the uva tour 
founded by, designed by former President Thomas Jefferson, founder of the United States of America, TJ, heavily involved in the creation of the University of Virginia. Y'all, they could not, during this tour, all right, for prospective students and families, they could not get Thomas Jefferson disassociated with that university fast enough during these tours and presentations. They're like, we will let it be known that Thomas Jefferson didn't lay, lay a single brick here. And when the university opened, he died a year later. He really has nothing to do with who we are and, and what we're about. And of course, that's because, you know, back in the day, you know, he, he was a slave owner and stuff like that, which obviously, you know, not cool. That was how stuff was done back in the day. That's what, what it was. A lot of history stuff you can erase and change. But um, because of that dark past, as they call it, they are, it, it seemed like the University of Virginia, founded by Thomas Jefferson, like they're trying to cancel TJ. Well, that was surprising to me. A little surprising. And it was fine. UVA is beautiful. It's gorgeous. We love Charlottesville as a family. It was a very interesting tour, though. Interesting students. I wouldn't do good in college now. I don't. I mean, I didn't do good in college back then, <laughs> so, if I'm being totally honest. But, you know, so that, that tour took place. Devin went with Kiki to go tour JMU, do the formal, you know, the official tour or whatever. And so they had a great time, loved it. She's got a list of other schools. I mean, I, I guess we're going to go see Virginia Tech. She has mentioned Arizona. She has mentioned San Diego State. She has mentioned... Just think of a college she's mentioned. <laughs> uh, she's mentioned a lot. You know, when you ask her, what's your main, you know, priority for decision, you know, the school you want to go to? And I do appreciate this. She's like, I want it to be pretty. I mean, yeah, right? Pretty's nice. A lot of colleges are pretty. But I think it really depends on what your perspective of, of pretty is. A lot of people think like rural is pretty. A lot of people think a urban, like in city campus is pretty. It, it's, it's really about perspective. So she's checking out places and I'm excited for her. But I mean, we know your sister. She's going to do what she's going to do, what she wants to do. So we'll see how that kind of plays out. But nonetheless, UVA, they, they, they hit me with the ringer uh, during the tour. So it was a little interesting. A little interesting to say the least. But anyway, this isn't about college tours and stuff like that today. Um, there was a movie from the late 90s, and it was called Payback. It had Mel Gibson in it. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie or anything. There's a line in the movie that basically Mel Gibson, he's not a good guy in the movie. And they, they him and the crew, basically they go and steal money. Well, he gets betrayed by his partner, gets left for dead recovers and now he's trying to get his money his portion of the the money they stole right and so payback and anyway the people who have now have the money is like a crime organization and it's a mess and it's it's not good people there's no good people really involved in here well one of the lines from one of the bad guys with the the, the crime organization you know he he says something like hey there's there's three ways we can handle this, right? And he, he's talking to Gibson's character. I think it's Porter or whatever in the movie. And he's like, look, there's three ways we can handle this situation. One, we can help you. Two, we can allow you to help yourself. Or three, we can have you replaced, right? And, you know, the, the, the point is he's making is, you know, we can help you. We can allow you to help yourself. We can replace you. We have an investment in you from time, money, resources, training. So in a way, us helping you is protecting our investment, which makes good business sense. But like those are kind of the three options. And I was I was laughing, you know, thinking about that. I was like, man, if that just isn't every like work environment on the planet, this just happened to be like a crime syndicate where this dude's about to get killed. Um, but 
everybody, it really comes down to those options. Like we can help you. If I have a, a staff person with a problem, you're like, we can help you. We can allow you to just help yourself and figure it out yourself. Or, you know, we can replace you. If you're not performing, you know, in your in your role or you have people on your teams who aren't performing, you know, how are these conversations going with them? Are you really setting out realistic expectations about how to work through their troubles? If they're if their their performance is lacking, they're underperforming, okay. What's that conversation? Are you coaching? Are you developing them? Do they understand the seriousness of the failures? We can help you fix this problem, Logan. We can help you work through it. We can allow you to fix it yourself. If you're telling me you understand where you're falling short, you know where your energy and efforts need to be and your focus needs to be increased, you're telling me you can handle it. All right, well, we as an organization are going to allow you to handle it. Or we can replace you. We can replace you now or we can replace you down the road if you prove to not be able to handle it yourself. And that's what we choose to allow you to do. We can replace you. But the best thing to do is try to save that relationship, that employer-employee relationship, that you know, contractee contractor relationship, because there's already resources invested there. The training, the money, the time. It is so much more cost-friendly to keep someone most of the time than it is to try to replace them. Because now you have to go back through and what? Train develop culture, make sure they understand the resources that are at their disposal, make sure they're actually good at the job. And sometimes, you know, the, the best devil to deal with is a devil, you know, that's not great, but if there's nothing's ever perfect, there's always going to be Delta. There's always going to be problems. And like, what's the unknown of who you're replacing? So three options. Again, we can help you. We can allow you to help yourself or we can replace you. I always try to lean heavily in grace in time for people to right whatever the wrong is. And unless there's a handful of things that are completely non-negotiable where there is no grace, there is zero tolerance. But short of those handful of items, and everybody knows what those items are who are in our organization, there's going to be a lot of grace. There's going to be a lot of opportunity to, to develop, to get up to speed. If you show the ability to be coachable, if you show great work ethic, if you show open mindedness, we're going to we're going to work with you to get you where you need to be. Now, if you're missing the mark and you don't show any of those traits, we're going to have those conversations. And again, it comes back to one of three things. <laughs> we can help you. This is what you need to do. We can allow you to help yourself or we got to replace you. That's it. A lot of times with, with newer hires, if you as an employer see enough red flags early on, man, you're probably not coaching through a lot of those things. Because early on, I, I tend to believe people are at their best. Like they're not going to get better than the, who they are those first couple months. They might get more efficient. They might get more well-versed in their jobs, their roles and tasks. But if there's character character you know traits that come into question those red flags that early on eh, those are probably going to even come to more fruition as time goes on because most people present their best in the beginning most people present their best in interviews someone shows up late for an interview we're not doing a second interview we're not rescheduling that interview if you showed up late to the interview barring really you know, extenuating circumstances, you just didn't prioritize it. You're late. That's character. That ain't going to work. Or you're wondering why everybody's always late to everything that you do. And that's because you allow a culture, you created a culture that allows people to just be late without consequence. So how do you help people through that? We can help you. We can allow you to help yourself or we can replace you. And that applies to everything, every role, every situation. It applies. We can help you. 
Now, if you're not equipped to help your staff or your contractors, your kids, whatever it may be, that's a bigger problem. If you don't have the resources to help them, the knowledge to help them, the the SOPs, the KPIs, the the processes to lay out in front of them so that they have clarity on what's expected, that's a you problem. You can't help them. The only chance these poor people have is to figure it out for themselves, to which you have to allow them to fix the problem because you're ill-equipped to fix the problem. And I would say you shouldn't be hiring people. If you're holding someone accountable to something that you have not shown them how to execute or laid out clearly what those expectations are, but then you're holding them accountable for falling short, well, that's some bullshit. No no one's excited about showing up to work for you because all I do is get beat up for missing a mark that was never established in the first place. That's like telling me I'm going to go, like, you got to go run this race. All right, cool. How, how far is it? Well, we'll tell you when you're done. Huh? <laughs> what? How do you strategize? How do you determine your your output, your effort output? How do you figure, how do you determine how hard you're going to go out the gate? How do you determine when you're going to stop to catch your breath? How do you, if you don't know where you're headed, how do you put strategy in place? Leader has to be the one to do that. If you're not capable of doing that, you can't help them get there. It's crap that you're forcing them to have to be the only ones to help themselves. And they should replace you rather than you replace them. They should replace you by going someplace where they have a strong leader, where they have clear expectations on where the direction they're heading, where they know what they need to do to execute on a daily basis to hit those weekly and monthly and annual goals so that the company can thrive, so that they can grow professionally within your organization. So maybe you've got to be the one who's replaced. We've had to replace me in a lot of areas within the business because I was the roadblock. I was the holdup. Maybe stretched too thin. Maybe not my skill set. Maybe something I wasn't passionate about. So put someone in that place who is those things and can be those things to the staff that they have reporting to them. You got to understand that. You got to be self-aware of it. You got to pay attention to it. But it all comes back to kind of those three questions. When there's a problem with an employee, when there's a problem with a contractor, when there's constant frustration, it doesn't get much clearer communication beyond, I can help you, I can allow you to help yourself, or I've got to replace you. That's very clear. And if I'm being told that, here are the steps you got to take, X, Y, and Z. You take them or you don't. And sometimes it's really easy to, to plug in, take take next steps and make it happen right away. Sometimes you've got to, you know, kind of gradually increase this stuff and build it in. You got to communicate, you know, with your leadership, with the staff, but everything has to be clearly, 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 clearly laid out as far as the expectations go. Don't leave it to gray. Don't leave it to chance. Be clear on it. So just something that, that popped up to me that I recognized. I said, man, this has a lot of, for a pretty crappy movie, this actually has a lot of practical kind of lessons in it. I was like, you know what, this would be good to share, you know, on the show and and talk to people about. So when you're dealing with troubled staff, troubled contractors, anybody really in a relationship that you're having problems with, it can be that convo and kind of run those questions towards yourself too. We can help you. We can allow you to help yourself or we can replace you. We can help you. And if I'm helping you, that's because I don't feel like I have put the resources in place for you to thrive the way you need to. So by me helping you, that's me making sure you're resourced, you're trained, you're positioned to excel. We allow you to help yourself. You can actually, all the tools and resources you need are in place. You just need to go make use of them. So I'm going to allow you to help yourself by making use of all the resources I've already had in front of you this whole time that for whatever reason you've ignored. Now, if I do that, if I've done number one, I've done number two, and we're still not getting where we need to be. Now we're at number three, and you got to go, like I do now. That's it. Catch you next time on the Big Dog Podcast. Share the show. Hopefully it helped. Hopefully you got a little entertainment and a laugh. And, um, yeah, go who's. Is that what they say at UVA? Yep. <laughs>